In times like these, we need faith that's victorious, and you can walk in it. Welcome to Victorious Faith with Pastor Mark Cowart. Hello and welcome to the broadcast. Good to be with you again. We're in our series, When Revival Comes. And there's a lot of different things we talk about in this series, but one of them is being ready for revival because I think all of us would agree that if revival comes and when revival comes, we want to be a part of it. But did you know there are things that can disqualify a person from being able to be used by the Lord? And today we're going to be talking about dealing with offense. Now, these are from our services here at Church for All Nations. And Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, look at that with me. Jesus said, and then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Well, Jesus is talking about the end times, the last days, and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we're in the last of the last days. One of the characterize, uh, characterizations of the last days is going to be offense everywhere. I don't know if you've stopped to think about it, but I don't think I've ever seen a more offended society. Uh, you know, people are offended if you don't acknowledge them. They're offended for this. They're offended for that. Just any and everything that can cause an offense. I remember um, there was uh, this horrible thing happened in Colorado Springs at uh, an LGBT nightclub where there were, I think, five people that were killed. It was, it was a travesty. It was tragic. And, uh, and a lot of people were wounded. And it's, it's actually not very far within a few miles of the campus of Colorado Sp of uh, Church for All Nations on our northeast campus. Anyway, so the first thing I did was I opened up the service and I said, let's pray for the victims' families uh, just unbelievable loss. And we got an email and somebody was so offended at me because I didn't acknowledge, they thought I didn't acknowledge what had happened. So we normally don't answer emails where people don't sign, but we did on this one. They actually apologized after that, but they thought I didn't. They just didn't hear it. They didn't tune in quick enough. The very first thing I did but I have found in all sorts of areas in the body of Christ, this one is one that really grieves me, that somebody would come up and say, I've been out of church for three months and nobody's even called me. Well, first off, what are you doing out of church? Were you physically incapable of getting to church? You know, there's responsibility as believers that we have to accept and take that responsibility. But a sign of the end times is offended believers and offended people. Betrayal, abounding, and boiling hatred. And so one of the things we looked at was Matthew eleven six. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Know this, the blessing of God is just beyond the offense. In fact, I just had something recently I've been dealing with that could be an occasion for a massive offense and one of the things I did is I make it a point, you start praying for your enemies. Jesus gave us instruction on how to deal with offense and how to deal with enemies, how to deal with those that hate you, how to deal with those that despitefully use you. And it's totally counterintuitive to the flesh because the flesh wants to get offended. The flesh wants to get even. The flesh wants to... Uh, you know, bring vengeance back in on a person. And so there's just things that we need to understand. And the bottom line is this, offended Christians are not going to be carriers of revival fire. And so that's why it's important not only to know what needs to be in place to bring revival, but what you and I need to know to be carriers of revival. So let's go ahead. I want us to join the service in progress now, and I'll be back at the end to share our free product offer, and I'd love to pray with you too. Out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 6, John the Baptist, one of the great men of the Old Testament, you talk about an anointed man of God, battled offense. 
He's in prison. He's ready to get his head cut off. And he says, well, go ask Jesus, are you the one or do we look for another? And of course, we went through that. He did know who Jesus was. He baptized him, saw the spirit of God descending upon him. And yet Jesus said this, go tell John, this is what's going on. And blessed is he, Matthew eleven six. 6, blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, how does that have anything to do with us today? Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And there are so many Christians today offended at the word. But you will never have them say, oh, I'm offended at the word. They'll say, no, I love the word. I love the Lord. It's called mental assent. The only way we can find out whether a person's offended or not is by the actions and the reactions of the heart. But the blessing is just beyond the offense. So here's what we learned. If you will handle the offense, because for some people, it's their husband that's always offending them. Their wife is always offending them. Their children, their boss. And then what does that do? That becomes the focal point of their conversations. Then you start the wheel of nature turning. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It comes out of your mouth. It reinforces what's in your heart. Then you begin to form strongholds of unbelief. But what are we talking about? Revival. And I can say this with absolute assurance that offended Christians will not be carriers of revival. Because revival is a fire that burns from within. And offended people have other fires burning inside them. Now some may be smoldering some may be raging, but there's a fire, a different kind of a fire burning on the inside. And you know, Proverbs 18, verse 19, listen to this, a brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city. I've seen this in the church forever. People are offended. Now, the event could be as ridiculous as a habit at home and how you put your dirty clothes away or how you squeeze the toothpaste tube. You know, you don't squeeze it from the back of the tube. You squeeze it in the center and it just drives somebody crazy. Now y'all think I'm kidding, but why are we all laughing? <laughs> because you're saying in your heart, you quit preaching and went to meddling. Get back onto the word. Go onto the word there. Here's the thing, here's the good news, here's the bright spot. Offense is the greatest opportunity for spiritual growth. There's no greater opportunity. Nothing provides the opportunity for the spirit of Christ to come out of you than when someone offends you. And there's something bigger inside of you than you realize, but you have to make the decision. Not being offended is a decision, it's not a feeling. Because if you go by your feelings, you're in trouble. Offense is the greatest opportunity for spiritual growth. And you know, I share this quote from Ivan Tate because he lives it. Ivan's one of my dearest friends. He's one I can just talk to for hours or we may go a while and not talk and when we get back on the phone together, we pick pick up right where we leave off. He's one of those friends, when you talk, you're already there. You're on the same. But he says, when God is ready to promote you, he'll send someone across your path to offend you, to help surface the pride and vanity in your heart so that he can promote you. Because the worst thing that can happen to you as a Christian is to be promoted with offense in your heart. Because offense is like a virus it can be dormant in your system and then suddenly something fires it off and full-blown sickness sets in. And the enemy will manipulate situations to where he gets you into a position of power where he can cause a lot of damage. He won't just take you out, he'll take a whole lot of people out. What happens when a pastor falls that's at a national level? I had people come to me when certain individuals fell in the body of Christ and they were you know, somewhat well-known or high profile. I'm not going to church anymore because of what happened. 
I thought, I, I can't even think that way. And I have said this before, and I mean it down in my marrow, in my bones, that if Billy Graham would have renounced Christ on his deathbed, and they had the world watching, and every news feed was there, and Billy Graham said, I have believed a lie. I am not a Christian. I am an atheist. It wouldn't phase me one bit because my faith was not in Billy Graham. And of course, the reason I use him because uh, that just never would happen. He was so consecrated to the Lord. He's a national treasure and he went out with his light burning bright. But I am telling you, I don't, if the whole front line falls tomorrow, my faith is not in them. My faith is on the rock, in the word, in the Lord. Now, would I be happy about it? No. It would not be anything to shout about, but it's not going to move me. David said, my heart is fixed, established, trusting in the Lord. He said, if the mountains slide off into the oceans, I'm not going to let it shake me. If you are on the rock, but when someone backslides because some other Christian did something, it's horrible what they did. And so we're going to learn a few things about this offense Here's what I hope to get to. Number one, offenses are gonna come, okay? Jesus said it's inevitable, and then he makes the indication it's, it's necessary. <clears throat> but he says, offenses are gonna come. So my question is, why are we shocked when they do? <laughs> I mean, we about fall out of our chairs when something happens and Jesus told us. They the second thing is how to deal with offenses because Jesus was very explicit and how to deal with offenses, pretty harsh. When we talk about how Jesus told us to deal with offenses, I would put it in the category of the hard sayings of Jesus. Do you know he said some rough stuff? He set his face like a flint to do the Father's will. The third thing, talk about the outcome of dealing with offenses, both properly and improperly. Because I'm convinced of this, how you deal with an offense determines whether or not God can use you in the full capacity of what he wants to. Most people are living far below. The Lord told one man of God, he said, most ministers, most, not few, most ministers live and die and never get past the first phase of their ministry. There have been great men and women of God that have been used in Lover, hater, like her or not, Catherine Kuhlman flowed in the power of God, but she did pay a price for it. And she said, she said this, she felt three other men turned down the ministry. And I used to think in my embryonic Christian stage, what fool would turn down a ministry like that where you have healing flowing? And then I got in the ministry. And then I said, oh, that kind of fool would turn down the ministry. Because we see the glory and we want it, but do we know the story? One minister said this, these young guys come up to him, pray for me, Bishop, I want a double portion of the anointing that's on your life. And he said to him, do you know what you're asking for? There is a price to pay for the move of God for the power of God, for the anointing of God. And if it was easy, everybody would do it. So the primary thing we're gonna have to deal with is offense. So number one, Jesus said this, offenses are gonna come. And that's in Matthew chapter 18, verse seven. Jesus pronounced a woe, and that's serious when he does it, Woe to the world because of offenses. And we know that the word offense means scandal, stumbling block, apostasy. It's all these things. So when you see a pastor that was used of God, orthodox in his faith and Christianity, just fall off the rails like Rob Bell, who went to Wheaton, which is right where Billy Graham went to Bible college, who pastored a Christian church, he is a complete heretic today. He has completely embraced universalism, says everybody's gonna make it to heaven. And then I think, why are we wasting time, effort, energy, and all this brain damage to get the gospel to everybody if everybody's gonna make it? 
It's doctrines of demons, teachings of demons. I promise you, I don't know him, I don't know him, don't know anything about him, but I'll bet you anything there's some offense down there, yeah. way down below the corpses that never got dealt with properly. And Jesus said, woe to the world because of offenses. They're going to come, but it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom they come. And we learned that the worst is those that offend children, cast stumbling blocks with children. People need to know that. You know what these school teachers and what these school districts are doing and sexualizing our children and teaching this perversion it's right out of the bowels of hell. They haven't even had a biology class yet, and they're being taught gay sex, shown, taught to explore, that you can choose your gender. You want to be a boy, girl, or any of the other however many's there are? No, there's only two, male and female. And now, if you express that you believe there's just male and female, marriage is between a man, you will be singled out in some areas, vilified and taken out. That's what they want to do. And so these offenses, but Jesus said, whoever offends these little ones, better if a millstone was hung about their neck. And I did a little study and the indication is Jesus, there are different sizes and types, but a millstone, they had the base stone and then they had the big running stone. And I, I read one commentary, those things could be over 3000 pounds, took an animal to drive it. And the indication was he was referring to something like that. So you get the picture Jesus is painting, you hurt these children. You'd be better off to have one of those millstones and tossed into the sea. You are headed to the bottom. Serious business. There will be an accounting unless you repent and let the blood of Jesus wash you. You will die in your sin and pay an eternal price for that. That's serious. The second thing is dealing with offenses. This is harsh. Matthew 18, verse 8. Jesus said, wherefore, Matthew chapter 18, verse 8, wherefore, if your hand or foot offends you, that's that Greek word scandal on again, cut them off. Cast them from you. Now, does that mean you're really supposed to go down to your wood shop and cut your hand off or your foot? Jesus is making a point. You know, there was a man caught or found in the subway of New York one time and he was trying to cut his hand off and he was quoting that scripture. That's called demonism. That's a demon got a hold of him. The point that Jesus is making, whatever your struggle is to keep the offense out of your life, even if it would be like having to cut your own hand or foot off, do it because it's better to live in this life maimed than to enter into hell with both hands and both feet. There was a man, Aaron Ralston was his name. Some of you remember this in 2003. He actually lived in Colorado a while, but in Utah, he was doing a thing in the canyons. And an eight, I think it was about an 800 pound boulder fell on him. He didn't tell anybody where he was going, where he was, and he couldn't free himself. And he stayed up there quite a while. That's him right there. He's now a motivational speaker. And I'm gonna spare us the details. But if you Google it, he gives the raw detail of how he cut his own arm off. And uh, he amputated his forearm with his multi-tool. It's the equivalent of like a Leatherman, if you know what those are. Using a dull two-inch knife and pliers cut around the arteries, took, you know, these camel packs, the water on your back and you put, he took that and made a tourniquet so he wouldn't bleed to death, cut around those and then had to snap his bone to get his hand. And just like that, if I read this, we'd all be, oh, <laughs> past the offering bucket. Whoa! <laughs> it's gruesome. But if I came up and asked any one of us, could you cut your arm off? You're like, are you crazy? No. And I'm sure he never contemplated that in life until he got, now the guy travels worldwide and he's a motivational speaker, but here's an exact quote of his. 
He did, quote, lose his hand, but gained his life back. That's what some people needed to do with the sin in their life and the wrongs that were done to them. It is wrong. It is wicked. It is evil what has happened to some of you as children, as adults. As a pastor, I have heard things that just get out there in that realm of near impossible to believe. But when I go overseas, it goes to another level. Go to India, go to Africa. The kids that Joseph Coney came in, made the kids kill their parents, drink their blood, eat their heart, turn the children into sex slaves and the boys into soldiers. And Bishop Joshua and some of those ministers have taken those kids stuff that is just beyond comprehension. So you look at some people and go, if anybody has the right to be offended, they do. But even then, offense still will do its damage. And that's why Jesus used some rough language. This is how you have to deal with an offense. You can't embrace it. You can't take it on yourself. You can't keep it. Bishop David says this, you can never arrive at the place God has intended for you in the energy of the flesh. You have to move in the spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us to accomplish these things. All the stuff. And yet, when I hear Americans complaining about how rough life is, I just wish somehow we could transport to India or to the Middle East or to China. Just heard that testimony of that lady that came from North Korea. You can be put to death for viewing movies from the West in America here. You get caught with some of our literature, 15 years hard labor in a labor camp, starved, just kept in horrible, horrible conditions. The devil is evil, it's wicked. So Jesus spoke against the traditions of men that made the word of God of no effect and the, all of the religious leaders got mad at him, offended. Matthew 15, 12, the disciples came and said, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Well, that's nothing new, is it? They hated him and they should have been the first to recognize him. But he said this, listen to this, verse 14, Jesus said, let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. If the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. It's not our job to convert everybody. It's the Holy Spirit that has to do the work. Some people you just need to let go. Let the word do the work. If the Lord can't do the work on them, what makes us think we can? He sends his word out, watching over his word to perform it. So let the word do the work. And so I'm gonna try to get to this third and final point. But suffice to say, be careful of cotton candy teaching and preaching. You know, I, growing up in Texas, my favorite time of year was they used to bring the carnival to town, the big fair carnival. Man, the first thing I went for was the cotton candy. Pure sugar. Pure white refined sugar. I think they call it white death. <laughs> but they, the guy would have it and they would pour that thing in there and the guy would go like that and the guy always had cotton candy all over him. You know, I thought, I'd love that job for a little while. I'd just sit there and eat cotton candy all day. Ah. And he would roll that up and you'd get this big old fluffy thing, a cotton candy. And I could afford it back in those days. I can't do that nowadays anymore. That is off the table. And you'd get that sweetness and you'd have to open your mouth real big. <sighs> And you'd stuff it in there, and as soon as it hit your mouth, it was gone. That's a lot of teaching and preaching today. We need the meat of the word, okay? Because there's, there's those that are still on the milk, and you've got to move to meat. But what is meat? Because some people have that very confused. Meat is doing the will of God. Same word, but now you're doing it. Jesus said, my meat is to do 
the will of him that sent me. Well, you know, the word says in Psalm 119, verse 165, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. <laughs> Can we live an offense-free life? Well, listen, I tell you, when you look at the life of Jesus and in his crucifixion, do you realize that when they were when they were illegally trying him, falsely accusing him and beating him, scourging him, and then putting the nails in his hands, mocking and spitting, do you know that Jesus actually remained offense free? I mean, that's pretty mind boggling. How did he do that? Well, he did it because he is love. God is love. God doesn't just have love. He is love. So, you know, you might be saying, well, that's good for Jesus because he is God. But what about us? Well, the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart and he's given us of his spirit. And so one of the things we can walk an offense free life. I didn't say you wouldn't feel the pain of it when you have to crucify your flesh. But to the degree that we give place to the word of God in our life will be the degree we walk offense free. So I always remember this when I'm getting offended and when I'm hyper sensitive to things that people may say or do or whatever. I know my word level is getting low. So when you get your word level back up, it'll be so much easier to walk offense free. So I want to encourage you to take advantage of our free offer. Download the study guide. It's on the screen now. Also, if you want to watch the broadcast or have those in your library, those are available for purchase. And also, I want to point you to our prayer partners right now. They're standing by ready to pray with you. Maybe you've got an offense in your heart and you're just struggling with it. And you need some help with it. Call right now and let us pray with you. And we've got people waiting for you to do that. And I'd love to close us out in prayer today. Father, thank you for your word because it is a light. It's a light that can go inside and dispel the darkness. It's a lamp unto our feet. And Lord, we thank you that your spirit, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us by your spirit. So thank you for what we've learned in the word today and may it bring forth much fruit in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today on the broadcast. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at the same time. Till then, may the Lord's richest blessings be yours. As Christians, revival is something we all desire and even pray for, but we need to know what the seed of revival is as well as what to do when it comes. In this series, you'll learn the keys to revival, how to deal with and move on from offense and much more. We're offering the study guide as a free gift and the video and audio series are available to purchase on USB, DVD, CD and MP3 format. Order this teaching today at markcowart.org or by calling 1-800-590-4764. Mark Cowart has been in ministry for over 40 years and is the senior pastor of Church for All Nations in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Director of the Practical Government School at Karis Bible College in Woodland Park, Colorado, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Truth and Liberty Coalition.